there, operating and teaching young researchers in Africa. So I, I'm a, a huge fan of Dr. Albright. It's my pleasure to have you here. Thank you so much for the invitation. It's an honor and a pleasure to be with you. I will never forget the uh, visit with you just uh, a few we a few years ago, not long. Yes, yes. Uh, and some of the best steak I ever had in my life. Thank you. It was delicious. And I, I, <laughs> was it a cap caprina or something like yeah. that? I yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Delicious. Okay. I hope I have the opportunity to do this again. Yeah, maybe. I hope. Yes. Oh, yes. So should I oh. begin? Yes, of course. Go ahead, okay. Please. So I will go to the full screen and you tell me if it's okay. Okay. Right now, um, wait just one moment. Uh, there we go. Okay. So I talked to Ricardo originally about speaking about spasticity and movement disorder, disorders in children. Well, these are all the movement disorders in children. And he very wisely said, that's too much for one lecture. So today I will just speak about movement, uh, about the neurosurgical tr treatment of spasticity in children. This next slide shows the movement disorders that pediatric neurosurgeons treat. But you see that spasticity is the major disorder by far. So which movement disorder is this? The child has plantar flexion, his legs are scissoring, his arms are flexed. This is another child. You see the plantar flexion of his feet. That's not a phys that is not a physical therapist. So those are two examples of spasticity. And I wanted to define it. It is a velocity dependent increased resistance to passive muscle stretch. So the more rapidly you try to extend the joint, the greater the resistance. And it affects agonists more than antagonists, flexors more than extensors. And it is accompanied often by cogwheeling, uh, like a ratcheting as you go down and by clonus. Now, as I am speaking and you see the slides, can you see me also or only the slides? We can see you. Okay, great, that's excellent. Okay. Now you remember the physiology of muscle tone, the output of the alpha motor neuron to the muscle is regulated by descending inhibitory impulses from the brain and by afferent excitatory impulses coming in from, from the muscles, muscle spindles. And if those two impulses are balanced, muscle tone is normal. But in spasticity, you see the X there something interrupts the descending inhibitory impulses. It could be a spinal cord injury. It could be an injury at the brain. But because of that, there is a deficiency of GABA, gamma aminobutyric acid, and a relative excess of excitatory neurotransmitters, glutamate and aspartate. And so the way neurosurgeons treat spasticity is number one, we can partially cut uh, motor nerves going out to the muscles, or we can partially divide afferent excitatory impulses, that's number two, or we can replace GABA by a GABA agonist such as baclofen. Now, when you see, oh, let me say one other thing first. 
when I finished the residency and for the first 10 years after the residency, I really didn't know anything about spasticity or movement disorders. But I went to a pediatric neurosurgery meeting in Salt Lake City in 1986 and I heard Dr. Warwick Peacock from South Africa give a lecture about uh, dorsal rhizotomies and it changed the course of my career. I realized that there are, in the United States, there are tens of thousands of children who have spasticity from head injuries or cerebral palsies or being battered. But these children are very common in the States and I suspect they are common in Brazil. And one of the surprising things about treating them is that you can often improve their quality of life, the quality of life of their parents, and they have value. Their function is often improved by your treatment. We can improve quality of life and function more in children with spasticity than probably anything else, any other condition that we treat. So when you see a child with spasticity, the first thing is to determine how severe is the spasticity. Uh, the original scale was called an Ashworth scale. And it had, it was five grades. There was number grade one, no spasticity. And then two, three, and four were mild, medium, and bad spasticity, and five was rigid. Well, that's been modified slightly. And you see here on the screen, now the zero is no increased tone, and then it goes up. But you can get this uh, on the internet very easily from many places. But grade their spasticity so you know where they are. And so uh, when you tell your physical therapist, and they will be amazed when you say this, you say, I have a child who has uh, spasticity of three out of five, on his uh, adductors and hamstrings on the modified Ashworth scale, you will amaze them. And then ask, what is the child's functional level? And the way that that's done around the world is with the gross motor function classification system. And these five levels, they go from walking without limitations to level five where they're transported in a wheelchair. But again, this GMFCS is readily available on the web from many sites. So now you can tell your physical therapist the extent of the spasticity, the grade and the function, but then you need to ask what, what sorry, that's my dog. What are the parent and the child's goals? It's very important to know those because sometimes, I mean, if their child, if the, if the parent's goal, uh, goal is to make the child normal, we probably cannot achieve that goal. These are the three general treatment indications to improve function, to facilitate care so that the child is easier to care for and to prevent or delay contractures. Because if a child has spasticity, say in the elbow flexors, and it's moderately severe, when they are two or three years old, the elbow can be extended all the way out. And when they're six years old, it can be extended about 80, 75% of the way out. But by the time they're a teenager, if you don't treat them, their arm is like that. And then, <laughs> Treating the spasticity is uh, too late. I'd like to talk about three different uh, cases with you. The first one uh, is a child with focal spasticity, and then we'll think about spastic diplegia and spastic quadriparesis. And at times during this talk, I will stop and ask for questions. So. Uh, if you have them, just make a note and then uh, I will welcome them. So this first patient was a seven-year-old girl. 
she had spasticity in the right plantar flexors. So her feet were pressed down. She was three out of five. So this is moderately severe on the Ashworth scale. She walked on her toes on the right side. It's only the right side. She had received Botox into the plantar flexors every three or four months for five years. She's tired of Botox. And her ankle dorsiflexion was uh, relatively good. She did not yet have bad contractures. So what are the treatment options? Well, more Botox. She's had it five years. Is, isn't there something you can do, doctor? Or a TAL, that's a Tino Achilles lengthening. That's the orthopedic procedure that partially divides the Achilles uh, tendon that you know, plantar flexes the foot. But neurosurgery, what do we have? Do we have anything to treat focal spasticity in the plantar flexors? Well, we do. We have peripheral procedures of motor nerves, but we don't know what to call them. In the literature, they are sometimes called peripheral neurectomies, sometimes peripheral neurotomies, and sometimes fasciculotomies but they all partially divide motor nerves that are going to spastic muscles. Now, in terms of the child we've just talked about, Mertens and Sindhu from France published a, a chapter, Selective Peripheral Neurectomies for the Treatment of Spasticity. And you see on the right, on the picture on the right, the black and white picture, the transverse incision, the tissues are spread, the motor branches uh, of the posterior tibial nerve are identified, stimulated, and then if we go back to the left, Mertens and Tin Sindhu treated 54 cases who had that spastic equinovarus, the plantar flexion, and they did selective neurectomies, that's what they called it, of the posterior tibial nerve, and you see that the Ashworth scores went from 3.8, which is high, down to 1.5. You remember one is, is, is uh, what well, depends on the scale, but it's minimal spasticity, and one and a half is a little worse. The ankle range of motion was significantly improved. So it can be done for the posterior tibial nerve. It can also be done for children who have adduction of the legs, because their adductors are, are spastic. I went to uh, Hyderabad, India and operated with Professor Pirohit. These are pic pictures of him doing an obturator neurectomy for a child with severe scissoring. And again, if we don't treat that, the legs get permanently scissored and that motion of, of uh, adduction over time dislocates the hips. So that needs to be treated. He operates on the lower and on the upper extremities. And this is a publication about his treatment of the upper extremities. Selective musculocutaneous fasciculotomy for spastic elbow. So these were 52 children, the mean age of nine and a half. He divided the musculocutaneous nerve into several branches, six or eight branches, individually stimulated them. He divided the branches that gave the strongest contraction, usually about 40 to 50%. And you see that two thirds of them had no spasticity in the elbow flexors afterward. So it can be done for the musculocutaneous nerve and it's done for other nerves in the upper extremity. This report by Marawi, long-term functional results of selective peripheral, now he, they call them a neurotomy. We can't agree on what to call them. For the treatment of spastic upper limb. This was a prospective study in 31 patients. And you see that they, they did this selective procedure on musculocutaneous nerve, which is mainly a, a motor, but, but also on median and ulnar nerves. 
And some of you are saying, well, wait a minute, those two nerves are partly motor and partly sensory. Uh, it's, but the way they did it was to, when they operated, say they wanted the median nerve, they would trace it down to the point where it went into the muscle. So they, they uh, decreased spasticity in the muscle, but it did nothing to affect sensation. And you see that dividing 50, 65, or 80% of the motor branches, depending on whether the specificity was mild, medium, or bad, their ASHWA scores, their hand function, and their activities of daily living improved. So selective peripheral neurectomies are underutilized procedures for focal spasticity in the upper and the lower extremities. And in my biased opinion, they should be used more frequently because they are excellent procedures. And I'll come back to them in, in a little bit later. Let me pause a second. Are there any questions uh, about selective peripheral neurectomies? Professor, I think that we can uh, leave the question to the end of the, the presentation. I think it's okay. better. Okay. okay. But, yeah. So the second case is a six-year-old girl with spastic diplegia. She has spasticity of three or four out of five on the Ashworth scale in her adductors, her hamstrings, and the plantar flexors. She walks with jerky short steps. She's flexed at the hips, the knees, and the ankles. She has had Botox every three months for four years, and she's beginning to lose range of motion, but her contractures are still mild. So treatment, option, treatment options for a child like that would include more Botox or orthopedic surgery or intrathecal baclofen or Dorsal rhizotum. Well, in terms of Botox, her contractures are worsening in spite of the Botox. In terms of orthopedic procedures, if you do not treat the spasticity and you relieve the contractures, if the spasticity has not been treated, the contractures will recur. Intrathecal baclofen, it's rarely used for ambulatory children who have spastic diplegia, except hereditary spastic paraparesis, HSP. Now, this is a, it's a rare disorder. The children are born normally and their development is normal until early childhood two, three, four years old, and then there's a second peak when people are 40 years old. But then they develop spasticity and slowly worsening weakness. It's really important to identify these children. Most of them have a parent that, is, or that has been affected. And sometimes two children are affected, sometimes one is, but the other's not. It's caused by a gene abnormality and there are um, about 25 different gene abnormalities that can cause this. But one of the things I like to tell residents is good judgment comes from experience and experience comes from bad judgment. And early in my career, when I didn't know about hereditary spastic paraparesis, I did a dorsal rhizotomy on two of them and the results were great for six or eight weeks. And then the spasticity came back. You should not do dorsal rhizotomies in children with HSP. And then the bottom line here, there's minimal data about ITB, intrathecal baclofen, in spastic diplegia and CP. This is one report, a two-year follow-up of eight children now the Ashworth decreased significantly. 
their, their function improve, the we them, that last one's a health related quality of life. But the, the, you, you don't wanna do that. I mean, they, we'll come back to it with ITB, but they, you know, it's a complex procedure. It has complications, it, it's very costly. And uh, so it's not the best procedure except for children who have hereditary spastic paraparesis. And for them, intrathecal baclofen is the best choice. So what about selective dorsal rhizotomies for spastic diplegia? There is class one data that is randomized prospective. On the left, and there's three randomized studies, one from Vancouver, one from Toronto, and one from Seattle. In the left picture, you see the Ashworth scores, white is before, black is after. And you see improved, 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 and then the summary improved. And on the right picture, that's the gross motor function measure, looking at function. And you see improved, improved, imp uh, not improved in Seattle. They cut a lower proportion of the nerves, but the average of all three studies was an improvement. So this is high quality data saying that the specificity is decreased and function is improved. Now that's what neuros, oh sorry, I got one slide ahead. I wanna show you two videos. The first one is a typical child who has specificity in her and some weakness and some contractures in the lower extremities. And the second child has fairly mild specificity. This would be about two out of five. And we can talk about whether or not it was appropriate to treat her. But this is the first child. She's had Botox. She walks on her toes only, only with a walker, only with a walker, short jerky strides. And this is how she is about six months afterward. She still has hamstring contractures. And then this is the second girl. Very different from the first, right? You can see a little bit of internal torsion of her feet, and this is after the rhizotomy. You see how fluid her walking is. Now, some people would say, and I understand this, they would say, you shouldn't have operated on her. But if, she, if her spasticity had not been treated, by the time she was a teenager, she would have had more deformity and more contracture. But this last one, the second case, that's a judgment call. And uh, I wouldn't quarrel with you if you say that you made a mistake, but the first one clearly needed it. And then after the dorsal rhizotomy, she needed orthopedic surgery. So neurosurgeons believe that's a good procedure. We know that dorsal rhizotomies decrease spasticity. We know that they improve gait and function. That first case, went from a GMFCS three to two. We know the complications are low. And that's in many studies they're low, like less than 5%, generally about two or 3%. And the effects are permanent. This is a wonderful uh, publication in 2009, 20 year follow-up from South Africa one of the uh, authors who had war with Peacock who developed this procedure. And you see on the graph that the dark gray is before uh, dorsal rhizotomy and the light gray and the black are one and 20 years later. And as you go from left to right across the, sc the screen, you see the vast majority have permanent 20 year improvement in spasticity. Well, we know it's effective. We know the complications are low, but there's two things we don't know. One of them is the best way to do the operation. Should it be done selectively, as Dr. Peacock described, or non-selectively? There's a report in pediatric neurosurgery in 2000 of 10 children who were operated non-selectively 50 to 70% of the dorsal roots were cut. And the Ashworth scores 
were significantly decreased and the gross motor function measure was significantly improved. And there are uh, three or four studies in the last five years indicating that non-selective procedures are effective. Now, there was an article in 2018, so just two years ago, doing them selectively. And they called their stimulation uh, intraoperative neuromonitoring. They did that on the motor branches of 13 patients. And before the operations, the neurosurgeon had talked with the physical therapist and they had decided for each of the nerves, the percentage they thought should be divided based on how much the specificity, how, how severe the specificity was. And they said that in 11 of the 13 patients, the proportion of the nerves that they cut was changed by the monitoring. Sometimes it was increased and sometimes it was decreased, 11 out of 13. But there's, there's two things that they didn't describe in the article, at least in the abstract. They didn't talk about the proportion of the dorsal roots that were cut and they didn't present the Ashworth scale, the, the results. So we don't know the best way, non-selectively or selectively. Now, in my practice, I've done about 500 dorsal rhizotomies. I'd say the first 200 of them were done with very careful, uh, they were done selectively with stimulation of each nerve fascicle. And the last 300 of them were done without it. And I can't, couldn't, I could not determine any difference non-selectively versus selectively, but and this is my lacking, I did not do the control study to see. The other thing we don't know is what's the best way to do the operation? Should it be done single level or multi-level? Uh, Warwick Peacock described it as multi-level. Now in that, uh, when I initially began doing them, I did a multi-level laminectomy. As, as seen on the uh, left, left picture, you don't, don't do that. If you do multi-level, just run the Midas Rex drill up both sides, lift up the bone, do the procedure, and then put it back down in microplates and screws. But the advantage of the multi-level exposure is that you can identify the nerves with certainty. You see that large nerve there on the left screen, that's S1. And then on the right, there's S1 coming in and being divided into five or six branches to be individually stimulated if you want to do that. But the advantage of the multi-level exposure is that you know exactly which nerves or nerve roots you're operating on. Now in 2006, Taesung Park wrote this article in Neurosurgery Focus in which he, he uh, showed on the A, that's a, uh, a limited uh, exposure to the nerve roots at the conus. And you can see in B, the electrodes are put under uh, fascicles. And then in C, they're moved around. And in the, in the manuscript of the article, Taesung, he's Taesung Park, he wrote this. He says, a shortcoming of this technique compared with the alternative method is difficulty in the identification of individual dorsal roots with certainty. He said precise identification of the roots is not critical for selective dorsal rhizotomy because all major lower extremity muscles in children with spastic CP receive motor innervation from several segments. Well, I want to know exactly which nerve I'm cutting. And yes, the, there is some component, I mean, virtually all of the nerves that go out to the legs and feet, there's more than one uh, lumbar level or sacral level that goes into the nerve, but still you want to know which one you're dividing, at least I do. Um, and I wanna skip that. So my practice uh, is um, to do the, the uh, 
procedure as Warwick Peak Doug described it. The multi-level laminotomy, lifting it up, doing the procedures, putting it back down, and then with plates and screws, it heals back beautifully. And you, I, you don't have an increased incidence of, uh, of lordosis or scoliosis. A couple of points about lumbar rhizotomies. After them, after a lumbar rhizotomy, spasticity in the upper extremities is often improved some, but it's not improved dramatically better. Secondly, they may lose function if there's not sufficient underlying strength. So make sure that your physical therapist evaluates how much strength they have in each of the individual muscles in the lower extremity. Thirdly, it's not effective for dystonia. Ventral rhizotomies are, but not dorsal rhizotomies. And the effects are permanent, as I showed you on that slide. If you like the decrease in spasticity, it's permanent. But on the other hand, if you didn't cut quite enough dorsal roots, well, that result is permanent also. Okay. So that's the end of the section about lumbar rhizotomies. And if you prefer to hold questions to the end, I'll be glad to do that. Let me just get a drink. Okay. The third case is a 12 year old boy who has spastic quadriparesis. So his upper and lower extremities are spastic. Their Ashworth scores at three out of five. He uses a K walker and a wheelchair sometimes. He's been on oral baclofen for a long time. He's had Botox into the arms and the legs, but his contractures are worsening and his spasticity is limiting his range of motion. So the therapeutic options there, rhizotomies, well, it's arms and legs. Orthopedic procedures, arms and legs, or baclofen. As we said earlier, if you release the contractures and don't treat the spasticity, the contractures recur. So a combined cervical and lumbar dorsal rhizotomies can be considered in severely impaired non-functional children. Now in doing this, under a single anesthetic, you do a C5 to 8 uh, osteoplastic laminotomy and an L2 to S1 osteoplastic laminotomy, and then do the dorsal rhizotomies to increase comfort, to improve caregiving, and to decrease the progression of contractures. Uh, most of my career was University of Pittsburgh in Children's Hospital, but I went for four years before Kenya to, uh, to the University of Wisconsin in Madison. And uh, uh, I'm gonna come back to that. Sorry, I, I got a slide ahead. The intrathecal baclofen for these children it's the usual treatment in the United States if improved function is a possibility. But it's probably rarely an option in Brazil because of the cost, the complexity of the treatment and the complications. Why is intrathecal baclofen so much more effective than oral? It's because oral doses cross the blood brain barrier poorly. If you give 30 to 80 milligrams orally, the CSF level is only 12 to 95 nanograms. But if you give 400 micrograms of intrathecal baclofen, look how high the CSF level is. So it gets to where it needs to be. ITB is put in with a programmable, usually a programmable pump. It needs to be programmable in children and then the catheter goes, if it's, if it's a spastic quadriparesis, the catheter should go to the low cervical area. 
And we reported this in 1993, probably before some of you were born. You see on the left graph, LE, that's the lower extremities. The spasticity goes down by three months and stays down. And in the red, the upper extremity spasticity goes down and that's a three year follow up. So we reported that first. And then in 2000, in the developmental medicine and child neurology, several other people reported decreased spasticity in the legs and in the arms. So we have, so many people have shown that it's effective, but what do non-neurosurgeons report? Linda Kroc is a physical therapist who studied intrathecal baclofen on the function, gross motor function measure, 31 children, GMFM before baclofen and one year afterward, and you see significant improvement in function, whether they are less than eight years old or older than eight. Another physical therapist, Christy Bjornsson, looked at the effect of intrathecal baclofen on oral function, speech, swallowing. 30 children, and you see speech increase in 10 with a star beside it. I put the, the star beside that because we don't have any other way of improving oral function, speech and swallowing in children who have spastic quadriparesis. And if your child was had no speech or speech that was not understandable because the muscles were so tight, you could know that if they had, if they were treated with intrathecal baclofen, there's a one out of three, 10 out of 30 chance that speech would improve. She also reported that the use of assisting technology was improved and self-feeding got better in nine and worsened in two. The rest of them, it was unchanged. And then the last effect, uh, Judy Gooch was a physiotherapist who looked at the effects of I ITB on caregiving. 80 patients, intrathecal baclofen for a year, their average age was 11 years. And these were gross motor function level four and five. So these are severely affected children. And before the baclofen, the parents said they picked out three goals, decreasing pain, decreasing the worsening of deformity and increasing ease of care. And then they filled out a questionnaire. And a year after the treatment, you see pain was decreased in 91%, deformity worse, it decreased in 91% and ease of care in 88%. So it's a really good technique uh, treatment for, for several children. Now, does it increase the frequency of scoliosis? There's a, one a publication in a neurosurgery journal, Journal of Neurosurgery Pediatrics. Do baclofen pumps influence the development of scoliosis? And their answer was yes. And they had evaluated six patients. But the answer no comes from two studies in the orthopedic literature that were done with controls. And both of those concluded that ITB did not increase scoliosis any more after baclofen than in the children who did not get baclofen. And the other question was, does ITB increase the risk of seizures? And the answer is probably not. It was developed, in fact, initially in the 1950s, um, to treat people who had uh, strokes as they, it was as developed as an anti-epileptic drug and it didn't decrease their, didn't affect their seizure frequency, but it did make them looser. So in Bonaguro's study, 150 children were back with, with pumps, 40% had seizures before the pump. Of the 40% with seizures, they were decreased in 13%, increased in two. And only one child had a first seizure after it. So they probably do not increase either the frequency of scoliosis or of seizures. So 
So the advantages of ITB are that you get effective decreases in the upper and lower extremities. You can vary the amount of spasticity reduction and it's non-destructive and not permanent but its disadvantages are the operative complications, the cost, and it's not permanent. The battery generally lasts seven to eight years and then you have to replace it and that's another $10,000. I'm gonna skip that. So we're nearing the end now. What about what's on the neurosurgical horizon for spasticity? C5 to 8 dorsal rhizotomies for spastic upper extremities, unilateral or bilateral, non-selectively, in functional patients, either children or adults. I'm going to show you a video of a woman who's probably about 35 years old that I did a, a cervical dorsal rhizotomy on her right side. And the video begins with me asking her something like, is your arm now different than the way it was before the operation? I'm sorry, I jumped one slide ahead. This is a, this is a slide of eight patients, um, children and adults that uh, I operated on the four years in Madison. And if you look at the, look down here at the mean values, the mean Ashworth score before, before the rhizotomy is 2.65 and afterward 1.56. And that difference is highly significant. This is not yet reported. So this is the lady. What was the position it was in before surgery? Kind of like that. Kind of like that. Sort of. Because you can't do it now because <laughs> it's open. <laughs> so you can't do it now um, because it's open. Just kind of like, yeah. I bet you had a stroke or a brain injury or what caused that? I had a severe stroke when I was 13. 13. 1977. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. Could you have done it? No. Is there anything that you can do now that you could not do at all? Um, just well, straighten my hand out. <laughs> that uh, that's a big thing. And um, um, well, with your fingers straight, straighter. Yeah. Can you use them to do anything? Yeah, I can actually open the refrigerator door. <laughs> uh, just little things, but. With that hand. Right. So this lady was about 35. She had a stroke when she was 13. And I did it primarily to make the arm looser so that it, it wasn't always up by her chest and so that it would go down and be a little more normal looking and it would be easier to move. I, I did not anticipate that her function would be better, but indeed it was somewhat better. You heard her say she could open her refrigerator door. So one of my other favorite statements is that the plural of anecdote, you know, anecdote is like a story. The plural of anecdote is not data. So here's some data about cervical dorsal rhizotomies. These are data from a five-year-old girl who had a, had a spastic left upper extremity. And she went to Gillette Children's Hospital, so not my hospital. And at the bottom, the AHA, that's the assisting hand assessment. And she had two assessments before surgery, one in December 2006 and one in February 2007. And you see the bottom line, the sum scores, 41, 44. And then I did a dorsal rhizotomy on her in three, three months later, May 2007. And you see three months after that, the improvement. So, I mean, this is data indicating function in that spastic left arm improved in a multitude of ways that you see, see described 
like moving the fingers, orienting to the objects and so on. So cervical dorsal rhizotomies, in my biased opinion, are an, also an underutilized procedure for spasticity in the upper extremities, and they should be used more frequently. Now, one really important point about all this is the treatment recommendations for these children should come from a multidisciplinary clinic. Ideally, that clinic would have all of these different specialties. Now, in my 25 years in Pittsburgh and in the four years in Madison, I never found a neurologist who wanted to be involved in that clinic. We did have neurosurgeon me, an occupational therapist, a physiatrist, a rehab specialist, a physical therapist, an orthopedist, and a social worker. And my wife, Susan, who's a pediatric nurse practitioner. But the advantage of that is that we all look at children or patients from different perspectives. And so we would each evaluate the patient. And then after all of us had seen the patient, we would have a conference and discuss them and decide what would probably be the best way to treat them, to decrease their pain, to increase their comfort, to increase their function, and to decrease the development of contractions. Okay, now your questions or comments. Thank you, Leland. It was uh, amazing. It's good to, to see your experience. And we have a couple of questions from the audience. And good. I'd like to invite B, Dr. Jorge Bizzi and Dr. Luizio to to join our comments and discussion. So uh, I would like to begin. So uh, Lila, sometimes it's not so easy to find a patient with pure spasticity. So some patients has a, a, a less dystonia, but the dystonia is there. So mm -hmm. if, when you decide that rhizotomies could help this patient with less dystonia, or when you associate a ventral rhizotomies, when you, do you have any clue to, to decide this? Well, I specifically did not speak about dystonia because yeah, that, uh, yeah. you know, it's, it's so different yeah. from spasticity. One thing I can tell you is dorsal rhizotomies do not improve dystonia. Okay. Yeah. Cervical or lumbar. Um, if we, if we have a chance to talk about dystonia sometime, uh, I would tell you and show you some data that um, particularly combined dorsal and ventral rhizotomies are helpful for, for dystonia in the upper and in the lower extremities. But it has to be ventral, not just dorsal. And you will see some children who uh, they're, you know, a, a dystonia, the definition, sustained muscle contractions that result in twisting and abnormal postures. And it can be focal or regional or hemidystonia or generalized dystonia. But especially for those where it's focal or, well, focal in the arm, they often, their arm will be out all over the place. They knock things off the grocery shelves and for them, if you divide about 80 or 85% of the ventral roots, cervical roots, their arm is not paralyzed. It is, is down, they still have sensation in it. They have some movement, it's not normal movement, but you have gotten rid of the vast majority of the dystonia. Yeah. Professor, there is a question of uh, Ricardo Oliveira. He's asking about uh, peripheral neurotomies. And uh, here in Brazil, we have some resistance from the neuropediatrics to, to, to indicate the procedure. Mm -hmm. And they prefer to indicate to orthopedists, to orthopedic surgeons. And uh, what is your, your advice to yeah. convince them to, to send the, the case to us? Right. Well, there are many 
uh, publications about the effectiveness of peripheral procedures for spasticity in the upper and in the lower extremities. There are many publications like that. I don't know any publication that shows that an orthopedic procedure relieves the spasticity and gives you long-term control of it. Yes, if they release uh, part of the, the elbow flexor uh, tendons, uh, that, that improves it for what, six months, maybe a year. But if the musculocutaneous nerve still, still has spasticity, it comes back. So ask them to show you publications from orthopedists that they can have the kind of long-term results that our procedures do. I don't think they can. Okay. And uh, he also asked uh, um, if a, a patient was operated by an uh, orthopedist, calcaneus tendon section, uh, is there a place for a selective nerve procedure after that? Um, so the, was this for plantar flexion spasticity? Yes, I think so. The, the, yeah. the Achilles tendon was partially divided, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay, so again, if so often they lose the ability to dorsiflex the foot after that operation. But if they had the orthopedic operation and the foot uh, still uh, is plantar flexed, yes, I think it would be appropriate to do the peripheral procedure if they do not have a contracture. Okay. Okay. Uh, is, is this there is very another... interesting. This is very interesting, Lila, because here in Brazil, probably the orthopedic surgeons uh, are better organized than us treating the spasticity. So I think neurosurgeons stay out, out of these patients for a long time. So Mm -hmm. If you if I uh, take the, the our health ministry considerations about treatment and spasticity, there is nothing about neurosurgical procedures. Right, but Only orthopedic I, I, surgical procedures. My guess, my my guess is that in all of Brazil, there is no multidisciplinary spasticity and movement disorders clinic. You're right. Right, because it really helps. When you go to talk to the Ministry of Health, if you have the neuropediatrician in there, you have an orthopedist in your clinic who, un, who knows the literature, you, you will have a much stronger leg to stand on. Yeah, sure. Professor uh, O'Brien. Uh, okay, go on, go on, busy. Okay, thank you very much for your wonderful lecture as always. Uh, so uh, if I understand, understood well, you are doing non-selective and you are tailoring your uh, amount of root cuts based on the clinical basis. Um, it's correct? You listened very closely. That is correct. Yes, okay. I, would, I would discuss this with the physical therapist before surgery. Mm -hmm. I knew before we made the incision approximately what proportion of each nerve root we were going to divide. And you have, you have in, in your mind how much you're gonna cut, but you still believe on this interoperative stimulation mm -hmm. on the classification of the uh, one, two, three, and four to choose which uh, rootlets you're gonna cut or not. You just go there and do what you have in mind, the amount you, you have planted before. Well, if the, if, the, if the child has plantar flexor spasticity that is severe, say four on the Ashworth scale, bilaterally, I probably would divide 75 or 80% of the dorsal roots at, at each of those levels, yes. But my question is, you have in mind, you're gonna cut 80%, but you divide and stimulate and try to cut the higher um, stimulation, the three and fours, or 
it doesn't matter for you? Well, as I said, the first 200 I did with stimulation. Uh -huh. right. So every dorsal root would be divided into four or six branches. And I would divide and I would uh, stimulate each branch, each fascicle, and see which ones contracted the strongest. But then I would I I divided it depending on the results of the stimulation. So it would be possible that if there were if I had five branches, and two of them gave very strong contractions, and the other ones not too much, I would divide those two that were very strong. But that would be maybe only forty percent of the nerve. It might not have been sufficient. So I would my preference is to divide it on the clinical severity of the spasticity in each of the muscles. But again, that's knowing exactly which nerve I'm operating on. Is there any minimum of rootless that you cut, in, despite the the the, the level of spasticity? 30%, 40%, 50%. You, you know that L5, sorry, L4 is, is the main nerve that gives you knee extension, which is very important, right, to straighten the leg. And so I almost always would cut a much smaller proportion at L4 than I would at L2 and 3 or L5 and S1. And did you cut S2 also or not? I don't because it goes to the bladder. Yes. And there are publications saying that if you cut S2, sometimes those children have uh, incontinence. So I, I never do that. And you know, the, in the legs, it goes to the toe flexors and that's all. It's the only motor function S2 has, as far as I know, the toe flexors. That's not an issue. I, I worry more about the bladder than I do about the toe flexors. Can I have one last question? Of course. <laughs> I'll give you two. <laughs> <laughs> so do you think, have any, if you have a plantar flexor um, spasticity, basically, you showed us, yes. you know, neurotomy, it's, it's a good option. Yes. My question, do you think L5, S1, those dorsal rhizotomies would be an option? Um, yes, yes, sure. But you know, it's a much bigger, much larger, more complicated procedure than the peripheral. And certainly if it's unilateral plantar flexin, I would favor the peripheral procedure. Thank you. We, will, we have a couple of questions from the audience. Yeah. So I go on with the audience and after the moderators can come back. So Jago Hoisker ask you, if you, what's your opinion about the rhizotomies in patients with GMFCS four and five, especially in poor countries? Yes, well, great question. So those are the ones I was talking about. The GMFCS four and five, they are severely affected, right? Their, their arms are usually like this, like that, and the legs are adducted and they develop contractures. If you do not treat them, they get progressive contractures, progressively more difficult to care for, progressive pain and joint deformities. So they are excellent candidates for the combined cervical and lumbar uh, dorsal rhizotomies without monitoring. Barbara asking you about the, uh, the difference in multilevel and the single level rhizotomies. Do you think the post-operative risks, especially uh, about urinary impairment, are different or do you think the risks are the same? Uh, say that again, please, Ricardo. In patients with the difference about the the multilevel rhizotomies or the yeah. single level rhizotomies, yeah. do you think the post-operative complications are the same, especially in urinary dependence? Um, the huh. 
there, to my knowledge, there are no publications that randomized children to single level or multi-level procedures. No one has compared the two. Uh, there are cases, there are publications saying that there are fewer orthopedic complications after the single level rhizotomy at the conus than after the multi-level procedure. Um, but I, I don't know of any publication that says the complications are the same. It seems to me probable that there are a few more orthopedic complications or skeletal complications after the multi-level than after the unilevel, one level. But again, it depends on how you close your laminotomy. If you just fold it down and put a couple of stitches, <laughs> they may get orthopedic uh, deformities. But if you put it down with microplates and screws and then immobilize them for a month or six weeks, there are very few orthopedic complications. Okay, good there are question. two similar questions about uh, age. What yeah. do, you, do you think there is a uh, limits age, the younger or older kids to improve the function or to improve the, the, the care? Yeah. Uh, that's a, that's a hard question. I think the ideal ages for dorsal rhizotomies in children with spastic diplegia is between age five and eight. Now they can be done effectively in early teenagers, but five to eight is ideal. And the reason now this is debated, uh, Taesung Park who developed the single level laminectomy he will do dorsal rhizotomies in children that are two or three years old. I never do because I have seen his patients that, were, that had a dorsal rhizotomy at age two or three, and then they get sent to me when they're seven or eight years old and they have, they have dystonia. Dystonia usually does not come on at age two or three, but by five or six, if they're going to have it, it usually is evident. And dorsal rhizotomies do not, do not help that at all. So I generally wait till age five or six or seven, eight. Yeah. Great question. I'm impressed with the quality of your questions. <laughs> Luisa, busy? Any other questions? Yes, Professor, there is another question. Um, is he uh, from Homolo Marques? Uh, if you have uh, a patient with dystonia and in spasticity, what do you treat before? <laughs> um, if it's combined spasticity and dystonia, they need to be treated together. Now, if you have intrathecal baclofen, that will treat both of them. But if you do not have intrathecal baclofen, usually, you would do a combined dorsal and ventral rhizotomy. Okay. And that's uh, right. How prayer is strange evolu evolution can change your uh, rhizotomy strategy? Say that again, please. The strange. Uh, the preoperative strength, how you measure in when you decide to do rhizotomies or not because of strength. Because of what? Uh, weakness after the surgery. Oh, oh, okay, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So before surgery, before dorsal rhizotomies, especially in the legs? Exactly. They have to have a reasonably good leg function. One of the important things is uh, they can they, can they cross their arms and stand up from a chair? They must be able to do that. If they cannot do that, and you do a dorsal rhizotomy, they will not, they will not be able to stand. So yes, your physical therapist must grade their strength in every muscle group in the legs. Another Lila, great question. But Lila, in the same way, if you have a child that is not able to do this, but mm -hmm. the spasticity is so high, Right, and, and the child is losing a walker, but the walker is 
is is absolutely all the the capacity for it to stay up yes. position. So yes. 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 <laughs> you 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 go on it do the result is to improve the specificity, sure. but the or you how you are uh, to do this with the family talk about this with the family because do, some families do. don't want to 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 keep the want to keep the, the capacity to stay stand up the child so well first of all you tell them that if the child's spasticity is not treated the child a few years from now will not stand up because the child yeah. will develop such severe contractures, right? So generally I would tell them that first. And then secondly, I would do the dorsal rhizotomy, but, de but decrease the proportion of L4 that you divide. Mm, interesting. Okay. Yeah. Do you think a, a, a Botox test before or a, a, a Bacrofen test before could help to the family to decide? Um, no, because if you give a, a, do a lumbar puncture and a bolus of intrathecal Bacrofen, 50 micrograms, the legs within 30 minutes will be like noodles, you know, just floppy. And, and you cannot evaluate uh, the, by the effects of a rhizotomy by an ITB bolus. Okay. And in terms of the, the Botox injection, you could get a little idea about how a rhizotomy might, the effect it might cause, but it would depend entirely on the amount of Botox you injected into the muscles, right? Yeah. If you put a hundred micro, a hundred units of Botox into your gastrox or your quads into five places, that muscle is going to be floppy. Yeah. Professor, there is another question of from Luciano. Mm -hmm. He asked you uh, in an ambulant children with, with upper and lower limb spasticity, how to decide between uh, baclofen and rhizotomy when you have access to both therapies? If their spasticity was three or four on the Ashworth scale in the upper and lower extremities, Probably, that's a hard, I probably would recommend intrathecal baclofen if you had access, if you were in a center that had experience with intrathecal baclofen and uh, had the PT and OT and physiatry and orthopedics and everything else. But particularly, you know, in a, in a, Brazil does not have a lot of multidisciplinary clinics. And if the person had access to intrathecal baclofen, but had only done three or four of these, I think it would be probably be safer to do, just do the combined, to, to do rhizotomies. I would first do a lumbar rhizotomy because sometimes you get enough reduction in spasticity in the arms after a lumbar rhizotomy that you don't have to do anything else. And that's published. Uh, there are two or three papers showing that. That that's, would be my question. You said about uh, cervical rhizotomy also. And uh, yeah. how long do we wait uh, between uh, dorsal rhizotomy uh, in the cervical rhizotomy in terms of waiting for getting better in the upper, upper in, uh, uh, right. the results of the, right. the... How long would you wait for a cervical after yeah. a lumbar rhizotomy? Oh my goodness. It would, it would depend on the severity of the spasticity in the upper extremities. If it were not substantially better within six months, then I would go ahead. 
Okay. There is a, another question from Barbara about patients with both spasticity and severe dystonia. What's mm -hmm. your opinion about uh, interventricular black baclofen infusion? <laughs> I'm amazed that she asked that. Um, so I have used intraventricular baclofen in 31 uh, children mostly. That's the largest series in the world and it's published. Um, I believe that intraventricular baclofen, IVB, has a lower complication rate than intrathecal baclofen does. And that it's more effective in treating dystonia because the site of action of baclofen to treat dystonia is probably at a cortical level, not a spinal level. So if you put in an intrathecal catheter in the cervical area, some of it, much of it goes down the spinal axis and then some of it goes over the cortex. But if you put it intraventricularly, and I usually used a endoscope and put it in the third ventricle, it goes out the fourth and then most of it goes over the convexities because the supplementary motor cortex and the premotor cortex in dystonia are excessively stimulated. Okay. Dela, do you think it's, uh, do you still think that is necessary to measure the ICP uh, in, the, in the lumbar puncture before to, to put a, a ETB? The, if you have a premature baby who has had uh, IVH and who has ventriculomegaly on ultrasound or CT scan, then yes, I do. Professor, I, I would like to show another, um, another particularity of uh, Professor Albright. He was with us, let me show you. He was with us in Belo Horizonte, I think in two, 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 2005, and uh, with his two people, pupils. And uh, the other facet is that we have the, our first challenge in tennis, and the professor Wright was the champion of our <laughs> tournament. And he plays very well. <laughs> Thank you. You were, you were very gracious to me. I'm not sure you tried your hardest. <laughs> he was the, the big but champion of was in, our tournament. But yeah. when I was in Madison, we played, I, I think, every, for a long month, every Saturday. It was so good. <laughs> right. Okay. Do you still play? Uh, I have not, no. When, when I went to uh, Kenya for those four years, it was uh, impossible to play there. Uh, the courts were not available and I was working 12 hours a day, six days a week. And uh, so after you stop play, playing for four years, it's difficult to start back. It's hard to, to get back. Uh, yeah. And the, the reason I left Kenya to come back was because I developed chronic fatigue syndrome Mm -hmm. And it lasted three years, and you can't play with that. So I think it's finished. Easy. Well, thank you so final, much. Easy. Your final remarks, please. Oh, it was a wonderful talk, and it was very nice to 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 be able to to do so many questions. And thank you very much. It was a privilege and a pleasure. And I thank you. Okay. Thank you, Professor, it, very much. It was a great pleasure to have you here. I hope I have another opportunity to invite you to talk about movement disorders. It's a, a very huge <laughs> problem here in Brazil. And I think the pediatric neurosurgeon has to treat this patient, only not the function of the neurosurgeon. I think we have capacity to, to treat and you have a 
huge and amazing experience. I hope Ricardo Oliveira gave us another opportunity to discuss with you this time. So thank you. It's a pleasure. See you again. Okay. Yeah. Professor okay. Albright, on behalf yes. of the Brazilian society, thank you so much for your taking the time to be here with us and sharing this excellent lecture. I think I, I'm sure that people love it, your lecture. So thank you so much. Thank you, yeah, I enjoy it. Of course you are invited uh, <laughs> for us for the next topic. And I'm sure that it is a very interesting topic because in Brazil we have so uh, few people that doing right. uh, disorder movements uh, in children. So I think that it could be very, very interesting for us to listen uh, uh, another very special talk. So thank you so much. Okay, you're welcome. Good day. Good day. Thank you, Professor. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye.